Today, I wanted to tell you guys the, well, start telling you guys the very long story of starting to experience symptoms of bipolar, getting treatment, my long struggle to get appropriate and competent treatment, you know, getting a diagnosis and how I managed in those in-between periods where I or wasn't getting treatment and where I am today and why. It's going to be broken up into a few videos and if you would like to hear the whole story, um, it's a good idea to subscribe. I'm not sure when I'm going to get to those other two parts, but this is the first one. So I'm just going to start at the beginning. Let me look at my notes. I believe like in retrospect that I first started having symptoms. Yeah, it would have been 15, uh, freshman year of high school. And I think the first real event that I remember was uh, my first depression. It was, um, at the time, I thought it was just seasonal affective disorder because, it, you know, and, and, you know, I am sensitive to light and it definitely affects my mood. So I'm sure that's part of it. Um, it happened during the winter where I was living at the time. It was a very cold, snowy place. I remember saying to myself and maybe trying to describe to other people that I felt like, I was in an ice cave. And what that meant to me was that I felt very emotionally cold and very disconnected from everyone and isolated, emotionally isolated. And there were certainly environmental triggers for that, winter being one, but also it was just um at a, a time in my family where we were very, where we were living together, but we were all very disconnected from each other. So, you know, I slipped further and further into this depression and at the height of it, I attempted suicide. So that was just, I don't remember. It was me swallowing a bunch of pills and, you know, obviously I didn't die. I don't think I think I would have had to take way more of the kind of pill that I took to actually die. I don't remember what kind, but um, I wasn't really, I just thought maybe if I swallowed any bunch of pills, I would die. Yeah, I don't know, as a teenager. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm glad it didn't work. <laughs> um, when, I, when I woke up, um, the thing is nobody knew at the time, you know, that I almost died or anything. I didn't wind up getting rushed to the hospital. I just, I passed out and I woke up and I vomited a lot and I was fine. But the fact that nobody knew definitely didn't help the feeling of emotional isolation that I felt. I, I think I told some of my friends and I, I remained pretty depressed for a while, but I, I did have a new resolve to live because I realized I was glad when I woke up. I was relieved and I didn't want to do that again. So that was a learning experience and m mercifully um, it was allowed to be that and not what it is for a lot of teenagers um, who make an impulsive, the impulsive choice and they can't come back from it. So um, I feel very lucky that I was stupid enough to take those particular pills. So moving on, uh, I think what happened next, I, I'm not 100% sure on the order of these things, but around this, the same year, I also had a manic episode. I think it happened afterwards. Um, and it, the way I remember it, I mean, the part that was very clearly mania that I remember was pretty short. It lasted maybe a week. So what was I saying? Oh yeah. Um, so I had this manic episode and what happened was, I mean, at least that's my interpretation of it now. What I remember is that one day 
not for the first time, but one day I was like smoking weed with some of my friends and it made me feel, well, it, it gave me a feeling that lasted, like I said, about a week, which is unusual, right? I mean, it's not like I was continuing to smoke weed during that time. It just, it triggered something, which, you know, now it's, well, it's still highly controversial. I think mostly because everybody wants to believe that weed is like a panacea that is safe for everybody all the time. Um, and while I think it's in principle, I think it's good that it's, you know, not criminalized. Don't get me wrong. I, I do think it's pretty safe. Um, it's not without its caveats, like anything. Nuance. So what it felt like was, I mean, everything was just so alive. Everything was so exciting. And I felt so strange. Like I, like I just had these, these, these new um, perspectives on everything and everything seemed so beautiful and exciting. And I, you know, um, you know, I couldn't stop talking and, um, you know, the things I was saying must've been really strange because in just the way I was acting, you know, I'd never taken psychedelics at that point in my life. And my eyes were like saucers. They were the um, my pupils were totally dilated. So, I mean, I remember, I mean, just to be specific, the thing I remember the most specifically during this period, which like I said, lasted days. Um, I remember going to the school library and picking up a book on Huey Newton. It was his autobiography and I was reading it and I was just so enraptured and I felt like I understood everything he was saying on this insane deep level um and I I I thought that I was the reincarnation of Huey Newton I was like convinced I mean at this point I the only you know drugs that I had done was like weed and I must have drank some alcohol at some point by then I, I didn't know much about drugs. Looking back, you know, that particular kind of experience, it reminded me of psychedelics for sure. And it reminded me of um, cocaine too, that feeling of like, oh, I totally understand. We both get it. We're like having this intense connection and we totally, oh, I'm having these amazing ideas. And they're I, I never knew anything could be so true. And I know with the certainty, I kind of tell everyone. I mean, that's, that's mania in a nutshell. And it, it is, okay, I don't want to say this too um, authoritatively because I, it's not my area of expertise, but um, I believe that what's going on in your brain, at least with respect to things like dopamine, is very similar to um, like cocaine or like meth, which I haven't done, so I can't speak to. You know, your your brain is getting flooded with all this dopamine, and it it makes things feel very significant. Um, it makes I you know ideas seem really 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 true and really really important. It just sort of intensifies your experience um, and gives you a lot of confidence makes you feel very physically energized. It's a really powerful feeling. But for but that time, you know, it was just kind of this brief thing. And I, you know, I don't know for sure that it was triggered by the marijuana, right? But I but I believe it was um, based on my subsequent experiences with marijuana, which I do not smoke anymore because it does very much seem to heighten certain symptoms for me. So that's a word of caution to not just people who are bipolar, but really anyone who has an illness with psychotic symptoms. You sh shouldn't be smoking weed, probably. It's probably making things worse. Anyway, moving on. Let's see, I can't remember what I'm doing. 
Um, what happened next? Right, right, right. Okay. So for a long time after this, you know, it's kind of hard for me to track because I wasn't diagnosed. So I wasn't thinking about things in these terms, in terms of mania and depression, you know, so I didn't make note when I felt certain ways or whatever, but looking back, it seems like I was fairly regularly hypomanic um, through my teen years. Um, not depressed a lot, but I guess sometimes I, I, I didn't have a depression like that deep one for um, years, many years. Um, because I'm bipolar one, so that means it's kind of the mania is at least okay for me. I, I'm just going to speak for myself. Mania is more the feature for me. Depression is also something that happens. So yeah, that was going on, and basically, you know, at the time when I was in later in high school, I learned about having. Asperger's is what it was called at the time. Now it's autism spectrum disorder. I learned about that and finding out that I had that was super, super helpful. It helped me to deal with some of the other stuff I, I, I dealt with and keep myself more stable. Um, so that, that's what I was focused on. And I, I was trying to care for myself, knowing what I knew at the time about Asperger's and about myself. And one of the things that I did was seek out spaces where I could basically be myself and not have to um, not have to censor myself a lot. You know, it's just because it was less stressful, and then I could connect with people more easily. And the spaces that I found for that were spaces where people, other people had various kinds of mental illness and neurological issues as well. And I found out later that a lot of the issues that my friends had and I had um, were considered to be linked, you know, so it, maybe it's makes a lot of sense that we'd be drawn to one another because we'd understand a little better one another's behavior um, you know, styles of communication, that kind of thing. Cause, cause we could, for all of our faults and for the many problems that are in some of the communities that I wound up in, um, we were able to sort of be comfortable around each other, <laughs> um, which we couldn't, which is not how we felt around most people. So that's, that's what I gravitated into. And so as my my bouts of hypomania became more frequent. I think they became more frequent. Again, this is all retrospect. Um, and as my symptoms intensified, very much that all of that behavior and all of that stuff was normalized in that context because, you know, I was hanging out with people who um, were schizophrenics, um, people who were also bipolar, you know, um, people who had all of these different kinds of issues that, you know, would look at the things I was saying or the things that I was doing and not bat an eyelash. It just was what it was. This kind of intensified, and I think in large part just because of the stress of being, I mean, at this point, the, the, the period I'm alluding to is right after high school. You know, I went out on my own. I was extremely broke because um, I, I, I knew enough about myself at that point to know that I really couldn't handle working full time. So I worked very, very, very part time and I could barely afford my rent and I found ways to get food and that kind of thing. But it was, it was stressful. There was a lot of stress and I was also getting, starting to get into doing harder drugs, starting to, particularly psychedelics, which was also very normalized in the context that I was in. And I'm not, 
I'm not really anti-psychedelics. I have very complex feelings about them, but I'm not getting into that in this video. It, I do believe that they contributed to destabilizing me to the point that we got to my first psychosis. So let me look at what I was going to say about that. Right. So one of the things about this community was along with mental illness being normalized, abuse was also very normalized. I went through a very abusive relationship with a man that was a little older than me. Um, you know, a young man, but still he was a little older than me and he, I don't know, I mean, mostly I think I was just 19 at the time and it's, I kind of knew that he was messed up. Like it's, I wasn't totally, the wool wasn't totally pulled over my eyes. I didn't totally trust him. I knew some of the things that he was doing were really not okay. Um, I knew I could tell that he was trying to manipulate me sometimes because he wasn't really trying to hide it. I mean, he, he was, he just really tried to hurt me, you know, but uh, I had this naive and kind of manic, honestly, I had this, these very grandiose ideas about, um, that we were supposed to be together. And if I just did X, Y, and Z, then everything would work out and, you know, he would be better. <laughs> And, and no one else around, I won't say no one, but most of the people around very much, I mean, really like when things were going badly, when they knew he was mistreating me, he would very, they would very much blame me and make him out to be the victim. The result of that is the situation just kept escalating, kept escalating. And I didn't really have a reality check about like, that I was being mistreated and needed to leave him. Like I said, I kind of knew this, but I also was like, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't want to listen to that, you know, and I didn't really have anybody telling, like validating that for me. Um, again, I don't want to say nobody. There was like one person in my life who was, who was supportive, mostly not. This culminated without getting into the details, which were very painful, um, in a terrible breakup. You know, there was some physical violence, then just total, like, in real life, ghosted me. Like, he just pretended I didn't exist when I was right there in the room. He got another girlfriend, I think, just so that he could make out with her in front of me while I was in all of his pain and he wouldn't talk to me. And it was, it was excruciating. Um, but more than that, I mean, I, I had gotten again into a depression, a pretty bad one. It was very, I, <laughs> I barely left my room for like three or four months. For the end of that depression, kind of what switched it into mania again is that I did a bunch of, I did stuff. I took some MDMA and LSD together. I did it on a night that was pretty hot and I assumed it would cool down, but it didn't and we didn't have air conditioning. So I was, um, I was having a bad time. It's very unpleasant to overheat on those drugs. And I thought I was going to die. I definitely thought I was going to die. And long and short of it is that when I didn't, it felt like everything crystallized. Like I was in all of this pain, all this agony that, that finally culminated in this, this feeling of you know, physical agony that I thought I was going to die. And then everything just kind of crystallized and it made perfect sense. Sort of, <laughs> not really, but it felt like it did. Um, I felt like I had come to this very important spiritual understanding that I can't totally remember. I remember parts of it. The thing about mania is there's so much, there's so many thoughts that you're having and so much, so much sensory input. At least that was a big thing for me. And I don't know if that's an, an Asperger's 
slash bipolar specific thing. But for me, it was like just so much stimuli and, and so many, and my, you know, my brain's making all these connections just as quick as it can and coming up with all of these grandiose um, sweeping proclamations. And, um, so you, you can't really remember most of it because there's so much, it's like you're, I felt like my brain couldn't record it like after the fact because it was just, there was just too much. Um, but I remember the next day, um, it was sunny and I just decided I was, you know, I found out, I, I went to go talk to my neighbor who was a weird artist guy who spent a lot of time listening to Godspeed You Black Emperor and painting crows, very old Portland. Um, and <laughs> he and a bunch of his friends were going down to Eugene the next day, so I decided I'd go with them. I just wanted to just be free and see the world. Um, I, during t periods at that time, I thought I was actually had died and needed to find my way to the afterlife. Um, this is as things got gradually more and more and more and more grandiose over this period. Um, I went to go visit my cousin. He eventually could tell that I was not okay. He didn't know exactly what was wrong, I think. But, you know, I was just telling him everything because I trusted him so much and, and just doing all this weird stuff, you know, collecting little things and just putting all of this great meaning into every little thing and, you know, telling strange stories and making strange statements. Everything felt divine or what I thought of as divine at the time. Everything was, it was like everything was on fire. Everything, the colors were so bright and everything felt very deep and very important. Or again, what I thought of as deep. It's hard to explain because really that kind of manic state is very superficial. It's, I mean, it's hard to, to dig deep because to be, to dig deep, you need quiet. You need for your mind to be able to rest and really mull things over and you can't rest when you're in that state. Anyway, he sent me home to, to Portland because I was going to go on this whole trip. I had, I don't know, I think I was just going to visit everywhere or something. I don't remember exactly what my plans were. And I was trying to find the afterlife. <laughs> so I guess I was trying to go there. But he sent me home and eventually I wound up in a hospital. And that's where I'm going to leave this for now. If you want to hear what happens next and about my experiences in mental hospitals and how I coped with my disorder after I learned what it was, subscribe. And you'll see the next video when I post it. Okay. That was a lot.